over time. We love to play hide and seek. Kind of a combination of tag and, and uh, just running and hiding, just having an excuse, to, especially in those uh, warm evenings, to be running around in the shadows. There weren't that many places to hide, though, in the couple of yards that we played in. So it was only a matter of time until they caught you. So your only chance was to try to make it back to home base before they found you. Now for us, home base was this huge tree. And it had a massive trunk. And uh, if you made it back to this tree and had your hand on the trunk, then you were safe. The big kids would circle ominously, you know, taunting you. They couldn't touch you. You were at home base and you were safe. Now, if you spend very much time reading the book of Psalms, you will see that getting back to home base is very much a preoccupation of the psalmists. They go through all kinds of trials and tribulations, enemies and, and uh, uh, catastrophes. They're always looking for a way to get back to the safety of God. And that's one way you could look at uh, the book of Psalms, as a kind of prayer pathways, pathways of prayer uh, to get back to this experience of God as a safe refuge, as a strong fortress, a rock that can't be moved. That's what you're seeing. Uh, those are the central images in Psalm 71, and those are the central images of God in the Psalms themselves. God is a refuge. God as, uh, you know, as a sanctuary that protects. So, whoever it was that wrote Psalm 71, they are uh, very much about that task. How to get back to uh, the base. And they're showing us how to pray in a way that uh, leads us back to home base. So, I detect about maybe five steps that uh, most of these psalms of lament, you know, where the or the psalmist is crying out that something's going wrong and, and God come and rescue me. In these songs of, of lament, there's about five, I think, crucial steps uh, to take note of uh, when you're trying to get back to home base. So step one is the rather inelegant step of just yelling for help. And oftentimes the very first thing you read in the psalms is, God, I'm in trouble, help me. So the psalmist is not um, you know, too concerned about, about uh, how he looks to others, that you know, I'm a man of faith and so I've got it all together. No, he just cries out. He says, things are horrible, I, I need help. So in this case, the psalmist is talking about uh, being pursued by cruel and unjust enemies. And he very honestly says he feels weak, he feels old, he feels vulnerable, and he needs God to rescue. So that's, that's step one. It's okay to cry for help. God knows that you need it anyway. So, step two is remember. And in the Psalms and throughout uh, the Old Testament and the New, remembering is very important. Remember who God is and what God is like. So when things are bad, remember that God is greater. God is the center of reality, not necessarily um, uh, the crisis that we're going through. There's something greater we can rely on. So the, uh, the psalmist is confessing to feeling shaky and unsteady, but the psalmist again looks at those images of God as very solid and powerful. God is a rock of refuge and a strong fortress. So you can imagine that if, if that becomes your context for looking at what's going on, maybe then you start to settle down a little bit and, and put things in perspective. Step three, again, remember, but this time, remember God's faithfulness to you in particular uh, in the past. I mean, we're all here today because God is faithful. We made it. Some of us just bear <laughs> So the psalmist, he looks back and sees God has been there for him, you know, throughout, throughout his life, from the very beginning. And there's this interesting image of God that only appears uh, a couple times in the Psalms. Uh, God is, is like a midwife. You know, God pulled him from his mother's womb. And uh, he grows up leaning on God. He grows up learning uh, from God. And, and through
through all of the things that go on in his life, he, he has occasion to praise God for wonderful things, for wonderful blessings that he's received. So this is important for the psalmist in, in connecting with God. Remembering God's faithfulness anchors him in who he is today. You know, uh, who he is today is anchored in God's reality. What God can do, what God has done, has brought him to this point. And that is a more powerful reality than all of our fears about what might happen. Joan Chittister says, Hope is always grounded in the past. Hope simply challenges us to remember always that we have survived everything in life to this point, oftentimes in better shape than when our troubles started. So why not hope in this situation too? So I like that idea. Hope is grounded in memory. Remembering God's faithfulness. Step four. Be specific and intentional about aligning with God's will rather than just our will. Remember, you know, even Jesus prayed to God, not my will, but thy will be done. So prayer, we lose track of this because you know, we, we get in the habit of seeing prayer as primarily you know, these, these uh, askings, these petitions that we make to God. Help, help me with this. Give me this. I need this. But um, prayer most centrally is about getting in step with what God is doing, not trying to get God to do what we want. So think about how precarious your prayer life is when you're always centered on, well, will God give me this particular thing I'm asking for, as compared to how am I getting in step with where God is, where, you know, with what God is doing. So the psalmist, he's asking for a mix of things. He says, rescue me. Don't let me be put to shame by my enemies. Don't forsake me in my old age. Now that seems to line up with God's qualities as a loving Savior and a refuge. So I think that's kind of congruent with, uh, with what prayer should be. But on the other hand, there are other parts of the psalm where he asks God to shame and disgrace his enemies, to consume and destroy them. Case, that might be a little bit more of asking for his will to be done, right? You know, a lot of times, uh, prayer is not so much a matter of finding out, you know, what will God, what can God do to comfort me in this particular situation. You know, that that's part of what God wants to do, certainly. But sometimes prayer also needs to be about asking God what God wants us to do. What do I need to do to be in step? And step five, remember the future. Rehearse the future. Because the future has already been reflected in the past. God has been faithful. God will be faithful again. So instead of expecting the worst, then the perspective of prayer and faith is to look for how God once again is going to be our helper and our refuge. And you see this uh, in, in the way uh, the writer of this psalm, um, in what he says toward the end. He says, you have done great things, O God. Who is like you? You who have shown me many troubles and calamities will revive me once more. From the depths of the earth, you will raise me up one more time. So notice that this hasn't happened yet. But um, he's already anticipating this uh, merciful act of God. God's going to raise him up out of the hole, the crisis, whatever the trouble is that he's in. And that hope, that perspective, already starts to lift his spirits and encourage him. Because that is how he's choosing to look at what may be coming. So that's how we start to get back to home base. Psalms were a form of prayer that put us back on the path to the source of reality, to the source of our well-being that is in God's faithfulness. That's the source. So the Psalms, you know, they put us in this bigger, more hopeful story, God's story. 
God is the author of reality. You know, not our worries, our concerns, our fears. Now, that's the story the Psalms are setting us in. If we pray according to that pattern, we become part of that larger story instead of the, the smaller, more cramped story that we keep trying to tell ourselves, keep worrying us and bothering us. It's our choice, though. We can keep repeating that, that confining dead-end story. We can keep looking at life that way. We can keep reciting the mantra that we have to suffer alone. No one understands us. No one can help us. No point in crying for help. We can keep focusing only on the bare facts of the situation. You know, this is what happened. This is the impact it had on me. This is who did it. You know, as though that's the whole story. And God has nothing more to say. And keep repeating that story to us over and over again. Someone once asked a rabbi, what's the difference between a cup that is half full and a cup that is half empty? Rabbis love to get questions like that. <laughs> the rabbi said, the one who sees his cup as half full leaves room for God to fill the rest of his life. The one who sees the cup is half empty depends only upon himself and leaves no room for God. So maybe that's what our, pray, our praying and our faith is supposed to be about. Leaving some room for God to be in the equation. Leaving room in our stories, in our feelings, in our expectations room for God. Scripture um, describes the kind of room that God gives us as a shelter, a refuge where God sustains us even when we're feeling quite vulnerable. Psalm 84 says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your own. That's, that's a, a beautiful image of the sheltering presence of God. God, in this, in this psalm, Psalm 71, God is not only that kind of refuge that protects and nurtures us, but God is also this um, very decisive midwife who delivers us in both senses of the word. You know, she delivers us right out of the womb. She keeps delivering us to all kinds of troubles that we encounter in our lives. And it's that constant, decisive, strong, delivering work of God that describes that larger, more hopeful story that the psalm want to put us inside of, that we need to live in. Because when we connect with that kind of tough, persistent midwife in God, then we start to take on some of those qualities. We start to become resilient and life affirming. And then we can start to find that kind of shelter inside of ourselves. God's presence is not only around us, it can be inside of us you know, as we have that kind of faith as we begin to, to see the world in those terms. So resilience, that's what God is offering us. That's what God is giving us. Resilience is, is pretty simple. It's just a simple act of getting up again and again and again and again, even when you don't feel like it. It means refusing to be kept down in your thinking, in your, uh, in your imagining of what's possible, refusing to be kept down in, in what you're doing. Again, sometimes it's just something that you do. You don't feel like it. I can't get up. I don't want to get up. And then you say, I'm getting up. <laughs> Scientists point out that uh, the more often you think or do or imagine something, the more probable it is that your mind will, will revisit that same mental stopping point. And if you trust in a new story, in new ways of thinking and acting and imagining, then you create new neural pathways and a new destination. So, if you want 
to create pathways that are hopeful and empowering, I recommend that you pray with the Psalms. The Psalms, you know, it's, it's not just a, a be happy <laughs> attitude uh, kind of thing. The Psalms are dealing with some real tough issues, some real struggles. But also, the Psalms are envisioning more hopeful and empowering God who rises above all of our skepticism and despair is the God who raises us up to make us strong and resilient. We're not just dependent on God. God also empowers us so that we can take action. So that's another way of looking at what Easter resurrection faith is. It helps us get out of bed in the morning even when you don't feel like it. Hopefully it'll get you there on time. But at least it gets you up. Right? So I want to clo close with uh, a prayer that I think exudes uh, some of that resilience. It's, it's a prayer you've heard before. It's uh, uh, attributed to St. Patrick. But I think it gives that sense of resurrection power, resurrection resilience that we can tie into every day. I arise today through a mighty strength and the invocation of the Trinity. I arise today in the power of Christ at his baptism. I arise today in the power of his crucifixion with his burial. I arise today in the victory of his resurrection with his ascension. I arise today in the love of seraphim, in the obedience of angels, in the hope of resurrection and a sure reward. I arise today in the power of heaven in the light of the sun. I arise today in the brightness of the moon and the splendor of fire. I arise today in the flashing of lightning and the swiftness of wind. I arise today in the depths of the sea and the stability of the earth and the compactness of rocks. I arise today and bind myself today in God's power to guide me, God's might to uphold me, God's hand to guide me, God's way to lie before me, God's shield to shelter me, God's hosts to secure me. I arise today through the mighty strength of God. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who dwell in me. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.